Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. In this video I was actually going to make a totally different video. I did the recording and everything, but Fareed responds, tried to respond. And by that I mean... It, it, <laughs> there isn't much to respond to, but nonetheless he's made a video response. And at first I was excited, I thought, wow, he's gonna, he's gonna actually engage with the arguments about the Injil and the Torah being inspired, preserved, and authoritative according to the Islamic tradition. No, <laughs> this, this is not what he did. He went to some other argument I've made and decided to tackle that instead, because presumably that's a much easier argument for him. But don't worry, Fareed, I've got you covered on this one as well. He doesn't go through the actual argument that I originally made. He just pivots to some other argument. Okay, let's see what he does. Let's watch. Uh, folks, I don't want to get too much into the history of Islam at the moment. Um, but we just have a really rich heritage in terms of the variety of sources and those sources that go to so many different eyewitnesses. I mean, there's a thousand hadith narrators. To dismiss all of it for these revisionist theories, well, sometimes I kind of wish that this would be the primary critique against Islam just because it's so unbelievable and so ridiculous. The Quran was not revealed in Mecca because it refers to vegetation and agriculture that wasn't present in Mecca in significant numbers. It refers to a group of people who were literate, who again, Mecca was not literate according to rock inscriptions. Muhammad may have been a real person who may have been considered a prophet at his time, but he was not based in Mecca. Muhammad, if he was a real person, would have not considered himself a unique religion separate from Christianity or Judaism, but rather would have considered himself as properly Jewish and properly Christian, but rather separating himself from other Jewish and Christian sects. Rather, what I would say is, I think that because of the borrowing of sources, the need for an authentic Arab identity that is rooted in their own religion, not in the Jewish or the Christian religions of the Mesopotamia and Northern Africa and so on and so on, they had to, in effect, rush a project to establish doctrine, establish a prophet and establish reliable scripture and consistent scripture to give them that kind of backing and to separate them from the others. I think if they hadn't have done that, they would have been in serious danger of conforming to Jewish and Christian beliefs more so than they already did. And at that point, they become, in a sort of more official sense, a Jewish or Christian sect. And up until that point, and up until Abdul Malik and beyond him, they were really a Christian and Jewish sect. <laughs> I think for it is a little bit salty here. So you're supposed to kind of give the, the benefit of the doubt in an argument. Fareed, I think, is just intent on trying to slander and ridicule and mock. I don't think Fareed can actually make a good response, ironically, to this kind of argument, which is the modern critique from a historical perspective against Islam. I think for him, that's just too much. It's too much. And Fareed will not respond to that other than with hand-waving and intentionally taking things and presenting them in a poor, sloppy, straw man kind of approach. And Muhammad may have not existed, peace be upon him, because the name Muhammad is more like a title, not necessarily a name. By the way, you can say that about so many Arab names. You can even say that about Farid. Farid probably doesn't exist, maybe. He's got a different name. So first of all, he's basically trying to say that it's just a conspiracy theory, right? The issue is, is that this is actually a lot more nuanced and moderate than he's trying to make it sound. My claim is not that there has never been any Muhammad of any kind. What I'm trying to say is that the standard Islamic narrative, which was a term that Farid actually used, doesn't appropriately describe that historical figure, which again is quite a moderate claim. Critical scholarship has long since thrown out the hadith as being largely exegetical. In other words, it is like tafsir, it's trying to read context into the Quran and to establish what that is, and that's one of the purposes of hadith as well as other aspects of the sunnah. It's also taking into context the time in which it is written, which funny enough happens to be dealing with a lot of issues that are present to the Umayyads or to the Abbasids. And this is recognized by critical scholarship pretty sensibly. I mean, it's not even that much of a large claim. It's just that, hey, there seems to be a lot of obvious pragmatic purposes to these hadith reports. And this is ignoring the fact that you can find obvious copies of prior biblical information in the hadith. For example, some of the parables that Jesus gave in the Injil, yes, the same one that both me and Muhammad acknowledge, Varid, 
talks about a parable which we can find almost verbatim in authentic hadith. There are phrases that he, Jesus uses that we can also find, again, almost verbatim in authentic hadith. So it's a fairly common and well-respected view that the hadith are, largely speaking, more exegetical and political than they are historical, especially since no one who is not a Muslim considers the science of the Hadith to be worth anything. Just to jump in here, because I can imagine there's a few other places he'll go to. When we say things like Mecca didn't exist, we don't mean that there was just a suspicious black hole in the world. What we mean is that the Mecca as understood by the standard Islamic narrative, again, Farid's term, is not correct. There wasn't this grand city of trade or grand pilgrimage area for pagans before Muhammad. There's no mention of this. And also, logically speaking, it's very difficult to rationalize. Take, for example, Dr. Ahmed Jalad. His work, as someone who looks into rock inscriptions around the Hejaz, has demonstrated that at least a century before Muhammad even came on the scene, all the rock inscriptions were monotheistic. That's kind of problematic if you genuinely believe that Muhammad was involved in a very paganized part of the world. In fact, it's not just a very paganized part of the world, it's a supposedly a center of worship for many pagans at this point. But of course, the rock inscriptions seem to imply they're all monotheists. That's a difficult problem. I can factor that in. I'm willing to go where the evidence leads. Farid is stuck with a narrative that makes about as much sense as a chocolate kettle. Taking the fact that Mecca couldn't have actually provided significant water and food to large amounts of populations to begin with, because it's a mostly arid land space. You're not talking about a fertile area where they're just growing trees left, right and center. The Quran mentions certain types of trees and, by extension, that which is grown like olives from olive trees. Funny enough, you can't grow olive trees in Mecca you have to grow them in the Mediterranean, further up north. So unless Muhammad had access to some sort of tree-growing machine that Allah had given him, it would have been very odd to reveal revelation in the Hajjaz, Mecca or Medina, that specifically talks about things that most of the population would have never seen. I find that odd. It would make a lot more sense if that verse was revealed to a group of people who knew what olive trees were because they actually had seen them around them as part of their everyday life. We also know that the traditions that ascribe Mecca as a particular city, which again is a funny term to use given how little people would have been there, historically speaking, a city of trade is wrong. We know this from the works of Dr. Patricia Crone and Michael Cook in their works Meccan Trade and the Rise of Early Islam, for example. We know this because it was demonstrated quite conclusively that there would not be any pragmatic reason for Byzantium, for example, to trade with Mecca or engage in the spice trade, supposedly, from Mecca. There are alternate routes, there are alternate places where it would have been cheaper and easier to get it from. Keep in mind that Mecca, in terms of its elevation, is a very low, quite close to the ocean level city. If you wanted to go from, for example, Taif, which is just to the east of Mecca, and then you wanted to travel to Mecca from it, you should expect a very big fall. Let's have a look at some satellite imagery of the landscape of the of the Hijaz, particularly around Mecca. Okay, putting Mecca in Google Maps was a bad idea because it thinks I'm looking for Mecca Bingo, which is probably Haram, probably. Muslims, you need to get on that. Can't have Mecca Bingo. So here's a topographic map of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. You can see Mecca in terms of its elevation. It's quite small, like 200 to 300 meters, something like that, from the sea level. Now, if we look to the right, we get massive mountain area with an elevation that's higher than a thousand meters. There is a thousand meter drop just to the east of Mecca, where for example Taif is. To suggest that people would have traveled along the mountainous area, which is a traditional account would have given, and then decided just to take all their camels and go down a thousand meter decline through mountains seems implausible to me and seemed implausible to Patricia Crone and Michael Cook, along with many other scholars like Fred Donner, Gabriel Reynolds, Dr. Robert Kerr. And for this reason, in pretty much any critical space, even Nikolai Sinai accepts that this is very difficult to explain, and he's very sympathetic to the standard Islamic narrative, and yet he understands you got a problem here. If you want Mecca, if you want Mecca to be on some kind of trade route, first of all, you have to understand how on earth that would have worked. You have the Red Sea next to Mecca, of which Sea trade is vastly more efficient and cheaper than trade by camels through land. And even then, the small size and population of Mecca, that's mostly arid, with very little fertile land, 
would have deemed that Mecca couldn't have been a substantial trade city at all. Its geography just simply doesn't let it. It would be the equivalent of claiming Las Vegas is a city that's 2,000 years old. That's the level of absurdity you'd have to believe if you think this was a major trading city and a major pagan pilgrimage for that period of time. And remember, for the Islamic claim, it's actually a lot longer than 2,000 years. It, it would have extended to the time of Abraham and potentially even to the time of Adam. Next, we come to all of the bizarre traditions that Islam applies to Mecca, which is suspiciously exactly the same as that of Jerusalem. Ignoring the fact that the word Hajj seems to be derived from the Hebrew word Hag, the similarities are plentiful. For example, the Jews go on their pilgrimage three times a year. And where do they go? They go to the temple. And what would they do at the temple? A lot of the times Jews would go around the temple. And they would go around the temple how many times? Seven times. Which direction would they go? Anti-clockwise. Hmm. Where have I heard that before? What would they do at the temple? Well, often they'd make animal sacrifices. Oh, that's interesting. Where have I heard that before? This is very similar to the Islamic concept. The stories of Abraham and his son Ishmael and Hagar. These were all traditionally centered around Jerusalem. But for some reason, the Islamic idea is that they are way further down for reasons. You have Safa and Marwa, two mountain peaks of which supposedly the tradition is Hagar would have gone between these two mountain peaks searching for water for Ishmael. Huh, interesting. You guys claim to have this still in Mecca. You can watch video footage of it and it's it's awkward because it's literally just a few hundred meters at best between two points to which the elevation barely changes because at the end of it, these supposed mountains, they're just large rocks that are just stacked on top of each other. Literally, it's, it's so awkward to say that this is a mountain. The idea that Hagar would have climbed on this to search for water when she would have pretty much would have got barely any height advantage at all from doing that because again it's just a bunch of rocks, not a mountain, is silly. And it's obviously, it, it just looks poor in all honesty. Compare this to Jerusalem. And scholars have long pointed out that Mawa, the Arabic term, seems to be derived from Mount Morai, which is of course the place of the Temple Mount, which actually is on a mount, an elevated part of the world. Likewise, Safa seems to be better understood as what is now called Mount Scopus, which, funny enough, is another mount in Jerusalem that is also a fair bit away from Mount Morai. And would you look at that? There's a valley. There's a valley in between them too. Do you know what many Jews would have done when they made their pilgrimage to the temple? They would have shaved their hair, probably because of the Nazarite vow we see in number six. That's a part of the Old Testament for it. Suspiciously enough, Muslim men shave their hair at the end of Hajj. The Quran mentions the standing place of Abraham. That's very suspicious language because to a Jew, the standing place of Abraham is Mount Moriah where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Isaac. And we can go on and on and on about the endless amount of quite obviously copied over traditions from Jerusalem to Mecca. This is without taking into account Daniel Gibson's work when he demonstrated that the earliest Qiblas in the most ancient mosques, which is the direction of prayer that you often have like a Qibla wall in a lot of these ancient mosques, they were facing seemingly a place called Petra, which is kind of odd, especially given that's not what the Islamic narrative says. According to the Islamic narrative, Muhammad established the Qibla while he was in Medina and he told his followers to face Mecca, that place where all the pagans were. So obviously something hasn't gone on here. Muhammad obviously wasn't either making his point understood well enough and it took them about 100 years to really figure it out, or this was a slow incremental process that changed over time based on the circumstances that the earliest group of followers of this religion were facing with at the time. If you think that's radical, you have no idea about historical scholarship at all. You're wanting to make fun of the term Mahmed, as that's probably how it would have been understood. You think that because I'm saying it's a, well, it's not just me, actually, it's critical scholarship, that says it's a title meaning the blessed one or the praised one, etc. That because Farid is also a title based name, therefore Farid doesn't exist. You see, this is kind of the, the very low level, um, just absolute dumb kind of claims that people make because they can't actually defend something when it's properly articulated. It's problematic to Farid to ever represent me fairly because if he does, he won't have much to say. And that's, and that's the real thing here. So let's explain. There are inscriptions of people being referred to as Mahmud, and they are referred to as Mahmud before the time of Muhammad. They were not Muslims in any sense. Here's an example for read. Dated somewhere between 518 to 523 AD, there is an inscription found in Yemen, or to be more precise, in Najran. 
Now, Nadran, at this point in time, as you know, is part of the Jewish Himyarite kingdom. We have found rock inscriptions where the term Mahmed, M-H-M-D, is found written in Sabaic Arabic, and it is used in the context of God. Yes, God is Mahmed. So unless you're trying to say that it, that it is appropriate to call God Muhammad, or call Muhammad God, perhaps, it seems clear that the term Mahmed has specific connotations like the praised one or the blessed one. This would make sense given that the Quran only mentions this title, as I'm claiming, four times. There are minor characters in the Quran that are mentioned more than Muhammad is. Let that sink in. Scholars have also noticed for quite a long time now that the passages where Muhammad is mentioned you can quite easily replace with Isa and it makes actually either the same or even more sense than the Islamic narrative does. Likewise, a similar problem with the fact that Mecca is only potentially referred to once. And of course, there's readily available alternatives, which are actually more realistic, based much further north in the Mediterranean, as opposed to hundreds of miles south in the middle of what was known as Arabia Deserta, a completely deserted part of the desert. Next point, Farid. Did you know that independent eyewitness testimony from this time, the time when Muhammad's companions, Umar, for example, invaded Jerusalem, we have accounts of people describing who these invaders are. Fun fact, they don't call them Muslims. They call them Ishmaelites. They call them Saracens. They call them Hagarians. They do not refer to them as Muslims. Christian understanding, it's not even just the Christian understanding, but the Jewish understanding as well, doesn't perceive these people as being a totally new religion, but rather merely as just heretical. That doesn't make sense if Islam was already as well established as you believe it was, according to the standard Islamic narrative. According to the standard Islamic narrative, it's quite clear that crosses are haram. The Christian cross is haram. And yet we find the first Umayyad Caliph, Muawiyah, minting coins with crosses on them, as well as the title Muhammad or Mahmed without the vowels. We also find, for example, in the Marcionite Chronicle, Muawiyah, the first Umayyad Caliph from 660-ish onwards, Muawiyah was praying at the site of Golgotha. Now, Golgotha, for read, is the place where Jesus was crucified in the Christian belief. So what on earth a Muslim Caliph has any business doing there, let alone praying there, seems very odd to me. Muawiyah must have been a very funny kind of Muslim Caliph, really. He's got crosses everywhere and all of his coins and he's, he's going to Golgotha and he's praying there. Nice one. The coins also had pictures of people on it. Whether that's supposedly Muawiyah, but some people also point out it may be Heraclius, the Byzantine emperor. These were coins that were minted by Arabs in the newly conquered areas of the Mediterranean with crosses on them and with icons on them of actual people. Very Islamic. I'm sure this was just done in the interests of harmony and peace. The Muslim caliphs compromised a lot and um, either that or he was a Christian. So just to summarize, we have the Dan Gibson research that demonstrates that the early Qibla walls on the ancient mosques before the 8th century never pointed to Mecca. They pointed to Petra. That's problematic for you and it shows that the standard Islamic narrative is wrong. Next we have the absolute plethora of problems that are associated with Mecca. Namely that Mecca couldn't have been a prosperous city at the time of Muhammad or before. The population would have been significantly smaller due to the limited amount of food supply and the fact that it was not on a major trade route. We know it was not on a major trade route because of the works of Dr. Patricia Crone and Michael Cook. They demonstrated that because of the geography and the fact that there is a massive mountain to the east, and supposedly if you wanted to go through the trade route, you would have to go down that mountain with camels and back up again, seems to demonstrate there would be no practical reason in doing so, especially since you could go by sea through the Red Sea, literally just a few miles to your left. The details in the Quran point further north. They don't point at Mecca. Olive trees being mentioned is very strange to a populace that may have never seen an olive tree. They would have seen olive trees if they lived further north. We have the mind-blowing stories in the Quran. Surah 18, just as an example for having many of them. The story of the seven sleepers. That predates the Quran and it's of Christian origin. The story of Dulkarnain, the two-horned one. Most scholars agree this is Alexander the Great because he was the one who at this time period would have been known as Drum roll, please. The two-horned one. We have coins of him with two horns. It's always this guy that's referred to as the two-horned one, Dul Karnain. You know that story in the Quran? The one that always made you think, huh, that makes no sense. Well, Alexander the Great, sorry. Dul Karnain was building a massive wall with iron and copper to keep this group of people stuck behind this wall. And that wall's gonna be there for a long time. Well, guess what? We know where that story comes from. It comes from the Alexander romances. 
or the Syriac legend of Alexandria. These predate Muhammad, and guess what? They were circulating in Syriac. So, where would you find Syriac? I'll give you a clue, it's further up north. It's not in the middle of nowhere in Arabia Deserta, where no one would have heard these things because it's a tiny little village and no one really cares. <laughs> everything we have in the Quran, in the traditions, in history, in geography, everything points to the fact that Mecca is not a viable candidate for the stories that are supposedly told about the Quran in order to explain it. It does a very poor job. There are much more reasonable and pragmatic accounts that can be derived and they're quite simple and they don't have to be so far-fetched. They can be just as simple as Mahmed was a title that was given to multiple people and then at a later date it was backdated to a specific person. I think that makes sense given the fact that the Quran only mentions it four times. They can be equally applied to Jesus. We have examples of the title Mahmed being given to Jesus and to others and so that would make sense. But nonetheless Farid, I'll say it again, you actually didn't address my other argument. This is just one argument. The main point I wanted to address Farid was the Torah and the Injil and the fact that your Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation and authority of that Torah and Injil that was around at the time of Muhammad and is still the same ones that are around today. I noticed that you ducked and jived and got out of the room faster than Usain Bolt. Don't think I didn't notice that, I did. But nonetheless, if you want to be educated on this argument, then I will do so. Whether it's the fact that your earliest mosques didn't face Mecca for some weird reason, but they all managed to face Petra are pretty much okay. Whether it was the fact that Mecca is simply not a valid candidate for a trade center or a city of any kind. Whether the fact that the Quran's terminology doesn't match Mecca, but matches further north. Whether it's the fact that Muhammad is mentioned in other places referred to other people, like in Yemen by the Jews where it referred to God evidently as a title, not a name. And for Reed, I can bring receipts. But in any case, please excuse me for the lengthy background. Uh, now let me tie this to the Islamic dilemma. You see, Christian apologists come across certain verses in the Quran, like this one, that speak about the previous books in a positive way, and come to the conclusion that the Torah and Injil are preserved. By the way, I've addressed the main verses that are used for this in multiple videos, including this one. In that same video, I've highlighted that there are explicit verses in the Quran that contradict the Bible. So the question is, is the Quran contradicting the Bible intentionally? Which is the subject of this video. Well, according to this gentleman, the original authors of the Quran were from a Christian or a Jewish background, which would mean that they were very familiar with the Torah and Injil that they were contradicting. This means that the contradictions are intentional. So, for example, these heretical Christian Arabs that were familiar with the crucifixion of Jesus in the Injil, what they did was they wrote this Quran, established this religion, and wrote in this book that Jesus was never crucified. And then they claimed that the Injil is preserved. 